Hello again, everybody. Um, welcome back. Good to see you and good to have you here with us um, for our latest installment of World Religions. Um, so yeah, we're making progress on our final kind of course unit. Uh, we introduced this last week as I sent off to you guys the last lecture, which dealt with um, different arguments that have been stated and argued for throughout history, which try to make the case that God exists. And um, today we're going to take a quick look at another one of these major arguments that tries to prove God's existence. So before I do that, though, and uh, talk to you about the new argument, I just thought that we could start by me summarizing the major points from last time. Because after all, you know, um, when we get to the philosophical arguments for God's existence, like the ontological argument that we were studying last time, it can get a little bit more, um, you know, complex. The format of understanding it requires you to see all these different claims and how they work together to, um, you know, establish the author's conclusion or at least attempt to establish the author's conclusion. So just briefly, um, we talked about how within life and in the philosophy of religion, there's three major categories uh, that people can fall into when it comes to the question of whether God exists. Some people are theists. Those are people that believe in God. Then there are atheists, those that don't believe in God. And then there are the agnostics, which are sometimes described as people who have neither position, that don't take a judgment on the matter because they think that there's not enough evidence for proof or disproof. Now, um, we begin this unit of the course by uh, learning those terms and then understanding that there's arguments that have been produced throughout history which try to make uh, a proof that God exists. So the first one that we studied was from last week, and that's the ontological argument, which was originally written by St. Anselm. This is a medieval Christian theologian and scholar who was later canonized as a saint in the Christian church. But um, back in 1077, he wrote a book called The Proslogion, and from that book, uh, there's an argument in it that's called the ontological argument, and it tries to prove God exists. So the way the argument goes is he starts by just kind of asking the reader to consider what kind of being God is believed to be, just the general definition of God and some kind of um, outline of what attributes God is often thought to have. And um, in the lecture, I pointed out that, you know, Classically speaking, God is often thought of as um, infinite in all these various good ways, so that he's infinitely powerful, infinitely um, knowledgeable, that's omnipotence and omniscience, respectively, that he's infinitely good, that's omnibenevolence, and that he's present all, all times and places, which is known as omnipresence. So um, Anselm just kind of uh, summarizes and says that God is generally thought of as the greatest conceivable being, or the perhaps somewhat more awkwardly stated, the being than which none greater can be conceived. So um, that's it. The definition of God, he says, is the greatest conceivable being. And he points out, or claims at least, that that definition of God is one that um, everybody holds in common. Whether you're a believer or whether you're a disbeliever, you would at least concede that the point of the definition of God is that he's defined um, as the greatest conceivable being. So after that, the author continues by saying that uh, some things only exist in the mind, like dragons or uh, the tooth fairy or, you know, um, I don't know, Harry Potter. They're not real. They're just fictional characters or creatures. They're just in the mind, but they're just imaginary. But then there are some things that are in the mind and they also exist in reality. That would be like, you know, a regular horse or the moon or uh, the White House and, you know, Eiffel Tower. They're things, right? But they're not just in your head. They're also objectively real outside of your mind. So um, the next thing he says is that um, between those two possibilities, only existing in the mind versus existing in the mind and in reality, it would be uh, greater to exist in both. So according to the definition that he thinks is universally accepted with God, that he's thought of as the greatest conceivable being, he would have to exist in both the mind and in reality because that's the greater thing. And... Um, it would not make sense to say he didn't because that would be like supposing that the greatest conceivable being is not as great as you could possibly imagine, which would contradict the definition. So using the definition and then the claim that it's greater to exist in the mind in reality than the mind alone, he gets to his conclusion that God exists in reality, not just in the mind. Um, but then he furthermore adds that um, God cannot even be thought not to exist because if a being can be thought not to exist, he claims this is less great than a being that cannot be thought not to exist. So two points, God has to exist in the mind and in reality to be as great as 
the greatest conceivable being would be. And also he cannot be thought not to exist. So finally then he has to contend with this issue of what is it that's going on when an atheist or whoever says, I don't believe in God, because Anselm has just tried to make the argument that that's not even possible to think um, because that would diminish the you know, greatestness of God, which can't be done. So in his way of trying to fix that problem, he says, well, then in this situation, the person who says, I don't believe in God or thinks it or says those words, they must not be really referring to the actual being of God, even if they use the word that often stands for him. So he thinks, therefore, it doesn't really count as a thought that God uh, does not exist. And that's how he's able to remain committed to his view that it's not even possible to think that God does not exist. Okay, so now today we're going to keep moving on on the same theme. We're going to try to learn about another major argument that has had a lot of historical importance about the existence of God. And um, this argument for today, anyway, it's, it's not the ontological argument, but it has its own kind of interesting label or name. This is the cosmological argument. Cosmological argument for God's existence. We've moved from the ontological to the cosmological. Um, now I wanna say this about this argument to be clear as we just get started. This is an ancient argument. Now, in our class, I think it's nice that we've studied a lot of the history of the different world religions because, uh, you know, if you've been following along, you know that these religions are quite old in most cases. They're thousands of years old. Uh, you know, Judaism goes back to like 1800 or 1300 BCE, and then, um, you know, Christianity is as old as the Common Era, Islam just slightly behind, starting around the year 622, um, Hinduism thousands of years old, and some of the Asian traditions are also thousands and thousands of years old even before the common era. Um, so the cosmological argument is an argument that's very, very ancient. It has uh, versions that have been written and talked about in the lands of ancient Greece, the 300 and 400 years before the common era. Uh, it was discussed by authors like Aristotle, the classic ancient Greek philosopher, but it was also something talked about in Hindu traditions that go back, as we know, uh, very, very far into the distant past, uh, thousands of years before the common era. So. The cosmological argument is by no means a new argument. It's very old. It's been around for a long time. But we are looking at a version of it that I sent to you guys in the PDF uh, batch that I had mailed out last week. We are looking at a version of it that was discussed and described by a more contemporary and more modern author. And that's this uh, author named Richard Taylor. So he is a 20th century um, American philosopher. Uh, he lived from 1919 until 2003. That's just the dates of his lifespan. And we're just looking at a presentation of the cosmological argument that he wrote, and uh, it's in our you know, materials. It comes from 1963. Okay, so just a few facts here to keep clear that I just mentioned to you. This is a, a cosmological argument. It's very old. It's much older than this man. Um, but he, in his lifetime, wrote about it in 1963. So he's just giving us a kind of, you know, slightly more modernized uh, discussion of an argument that has really, really ancient roots. So it's the cosmological argument, our version by Richard Taylor, 1963. Okay, now back to the argument itself, setting aside the biographical uh, sort of sketch of the author that I've given to you. Uh, we want to know what does the cosmological argument mean. So let's try to think about the words themselves that are used to give a title to the argument. You may notice that one of the words here, cosmological, uh, has a sort of root word in it, and that is the word cosmos. So it's the cosmological argument based off the root uh, of cosmo, meaning cosmos. Now what's the cosmos? <clears throat> so if you're thinking about this as you're watching this lecture, you maybe already have a general idea what the cosmos is. If you're thinking that it's universe, the whole universe, good. That's basically it. So the cosmos is the entire universe. That's what that word means. Okay, so we're not just talking about a part of the universe, like the planet Earth or the, you know, the solar system that we are a part of, or even just the Milky Way galaxy. We're talking about the entire, entire extension of all space and time. So that whole physical system that we're just a tiny little piece of, the universe, 
The question then of the argument is this. What could possibly be the cause for the fact that the universe exists? What could be the cause, the origin of the universe? That's a very deep question because it's not like asking the question, well, how did a thing inside the universe start existing? You know, if we were going to trace back the existence of this pen, we would find that it derived from a factory which used raw materials from the earth and produced such things. And there's definitely a beginning. He's saying it to you and me. Uh, here I am lecturing to you, and it's because of two people that met, you know, quite a while ago and conceived me, and then now I'm the product of that. But everything has a start, right? You don't usually think about the entire universe, though, in these terms. Um, so the question is, what could be the cause, not of some item within the universe or a sub part of it, but the whole entire system? What could be the cause of the universe overall? So um, by the time we get to the conclusion of the argument, you'll see how the author tries to make the case that the only possible cause for the cosmos, for the universe, would have to be some kind of creator god uh, a necessary being, the only thing he believes that can actually satisfy our question about what's the possible cause of the universe. Okay, so with that as our little preview anyway, now I'm going to sort of walk you through all the major details. And I appreciate, you know, if you had read the essay and even if there were some parts of it that seemed a bit confusing, technical, or perhaps just wordy, um, it's good for you to read that um, because it helps to work in, in tandem with the lecture content that I give you because now I'm sure I'll be able to you know, clarify some of it and break it down, bring it down to earth just a bit if it was confusing at all. So, okay, the author Taylor cosmological argument that we're talking about, right, he starts off with a hypothetical scenario. Now, um, just so you guys understand, um, hypothetical scenarios are common features of philosophical argument and writing. These hypothetical scenarios, they're chosen by the author, not necessarily because they're realistic, not because there's something that would probably ever really happen, but just in order to set the terms of an argument, in order to provide um, intuitions that can help assist in reaching the conclusion of the author's argument. So it's just helping us to think through uh, the features of an argument and to establish reasons for some claim. So here's the hypothetical scenario that this author starts us off with. He says, I want you to imagine, just you know, suppose this really happened. Imagine that you were walking around in the woods, like a forested, um, sort of wooded area, right? A natural setting. You're walking around having a nice walk. But you come across all kinds of things that you'd expect to see in the woods, like you know, trees and bushes and maybe little woodland creatures and stuff. But then you come across something that's quite unusual which you would usually never think that you would see in the woods, and that is a big sphere. Now, <clears throat> there's nothing, um, I mean, the sphere, it's, it's very odd, right? It's just like a big, let's say, transparent sphere. Um, maybe it's made out of some material like glass or plastic or something, but it's just sitting there in the woods. It's about, it's big too. It's like about your standing height. So, like, I don't know, sometimes a little visual helps people. So that would be you in our case. Here's the sphere. Look at me try to draw a glimmer of light that's just uh, shining on the curved surface of that sphere. We'll pretend it's three-dimensional. So you see a sphere in the woods. Now, um, the author just wants to get this point out there based off that example, that any normal person who saw the sphere in the woods while they were just taking a walk in nature, right, that type of person, whoever they were, they would stop at least for a minute and they would react to it by, how do you think? Well, the author's point is that they'd be curious, at least. At least for a moment, you'd have a moment's thought, like, I wonder what that is doing there. Or I wonder how that got in the place where it is. Because it's a totally unusual thing to see in the woods, you know, a big standing height sphere. Um, now, if you see something that's out of its norm ordinary context, that usually will trigger at least a, a slight moment of curious thoughts. It'd be, I think, a kind of strange person who just didn't even bat an eye at it or who saw it and thought, okay, sphere, nothing to see there, just typical day in the woods. Since it's so out of place and so sort of um, not in a typical location, it would lead to thoughts of curiosity as to its origins and what its ultimate cause was. You don't know what the cause of it is in our example, but you know that it has to have some type of cause or explanation because it couldn't just get there out of nowhere, right? So this example just is helping to support 
a little thought process that the author is using to help build the larger argument. And that is anything that exists has to have an explanation or a cause. Now he uses this odd example of a sphere only because the fact that it's so unusual would lead to these curious uh, and inquisitive thoughts about where it came from. But he then points this out, that we usually are only triggered to think about um, such curious questions as to what something's origin is when it's out of place, when it's in an unusual place. When something is in its normal place um, and an expected or typical place, then we usually don't have those same thoughts. But the thought he gives next is, couldn't we, though, ask the same question even about something that we would expect to see in a given location? Like, I don't know. I mean, um, on this table, just because I'm having refreshments for, you know, my class in case I ever need to take a sip of something, I have a can of sparkling water. Um, now, you know, if you looked in the grocery store and you saw, like, I don't know, beverages in the beverage aisle, you probably wouldn't stop and be like, how did that get there? What caused it to be there? Because it's something that's normal to see in a grocery store location. Just like if it was the woods and you saw like a regular bush, you probably wouldn't pause and be like, how did that bush get there? What is its origin story? But the point the author's making now is that even though those thoughts might not typically be triggered by a sight of something that is usual and commonplace, couldn't the question be posed if you were really that just much of a curious type person? And the answer is, of course, yes. Just as much as the per strange example of the sphere that he gives, this can of sparkling water also has to have an origin, even if I don't know the precise information about which factory it came from or what part of the world the raw materials that are used to form the aluminum of the can. Even if I don't know all those details, I still know that it had to have some backstory, uh, even if I never become aware of it, because again, the point is just quite general, not only with respect to odd, unusual things of this sort, but even if everyday things are seen, they also have to have some kind of ultimate origin, which we know, it's just that we don't usually think much about it because we only gain curiosity when something's unusual. If you walk into say like an art museum, a modern art museum, and you saw the sphere in one of the galleries, maybe you wouldn't be like, where did it come from? Because it's more a typical thing to see in that location, but it's out of place in the natural location of the forest. So if you've been following me to this point in our discussion, here's all I want you to take away from what the author presented. That if you saw a sphere in the forest like that, it's so weird that you'd stop and think for a minute, how did it get there and what is its cause? And then he quickly switches from that example to making the more general point that it's not just something weird and out of place. Of course, those would lead to these questions, but also everyday and ordinary things. Uh, whether we question why they started to exist or not or how, we know they must have some kind of ultimate cause or origin that brought them into existence. So this all then leads us to the statement of a principle, this example and the discussion that surrounds it. It's all for the sake of the author putting forward a principle and that principle he calls, well, it's not just him calling it that, but it's, got, it's also got its own long history. It's known as the principle of sufficient reason. So I'm going to type it here into our typed chat so you can sort of see that point. Principle of sufficient reason. Okay, so the principle of sufficient reason just makes explicit what I was just stating to you just in conversation just now. It says this point that um, everything that exists for everything that exists, there has to be some sufficient reason, cause, or explanation for its existence. Basically, everything has to have a cause. If it exists, it's got to have a cause. So the statement goes this way. In the case of any positive truth, So in the case of any positive truth, there has to be a sufficient reason or a cause for it. Let me now expand on uh, one term that's included in the statement that he gives of this principle. It's the term positive truth. So what does that mean? Positive truth just refers to the fact that something exists, okay? That something affirmatively exists. A negative truth, by contrast, would be a statement which reports that something does not exist at a current place or time. Now, with respect to the positive truths, they have to have a cause because they're things that exist. So, like, the fact that this can exist means that 
there has to be a cause or an explanation for it. It's something, it's a being, it exists, so it has to have a start and it has to have a cause. Uh, negative truths, though, they don't apply to the same principle here. Um, so the fact that something does not exist in a given location is the negation of there being something. So that doesn't require any uh, explanation or cause. For example, you can see on this table right now that there is no, let me think of a random animal, that there's no um, anteater here. Um, you know, I'm talking about there's no like physical anteater on this table. And um, that's not something that has to have a cause or an explanation. The non-existence of the anteater doesn't need a cause because it's not like there's an assumption that there ought to be one. Uh, but if there were an anteater on the table, then of course it would have had to have a cause from you know the parents of that specimen, etc. So the non-existence of an object doesn't require some backstory, but the existence of something, of course, does, and that's what a positive truth is. So now again, the principle of sufficient reason. What it's saying, just to break down the you know more complex philosophical way it's stated there, it's just that if something exists, there had to be a cause for it. There has to be something that generated it, that caused it. Uh, in the past, there had to be something that got it started for a thing that exists, that affirmatively does exist. Okay, now next, as the argument continues, the author points out that there are two types of truths. So this is the next thing that has to be mentioned as we continue with our um, discussion. We talked about positive truths, but I'm not referring to that distinction. A further distinction in terms of types of truths, the author identifies two types. So two types of truth. <clears throat> two types of truth. So one type of truth are called contingent truths. And then another type of truth are called necessary truths. So let me just start with the top and talk to you about definition and some examples of contingent truths. Okay, so a contingent truth is something which is true, but it didn't need to be true. It could have been false in a slightly different uh, set of circumstances. Okay, so something which is true, but could have been false under different circumstances. Okay, so what I wrote here is just the definition of contingent truth. Something that is true but could have been false in different circumstances, could have been false if things had been different. But then necessary truths, uh, as you might imagine, the contrast here is that these are also things that are true, but instead of it being possible for them to be false, they could never be false. It's not even possible. So necessary, something that is true and could not possibly be false. Could not even in like theoretically could not be possibly false. Could not possibly be false. Okay. So contingent truths, necessary truths. Now let me explain some examples of both so that you get it even a little bit better. Um so, I don't know, take the fact that you are a student in this class. That's true, isn't it? If you're watching this, yes. But even though it's true, it could have been false if, I don't know, any number of things had gone differently. Suppose that you had chosen a different class, or suppose that, I don't know, I, at the last moment, was not available to teach it and it got canceled. Or even worse, I don't know, suppose that tragically some injury had occurred to you or something such that you could no longer even go to school or take classes at all. So I'm happy you're in the class and it's true that you are, but we can imagine a different version of reality where that could have been false, okay? Or I don't know, like um, it's true that I'm wearing this watch, but suppose that uh, I had lost my watch over the weekend or suppose that I just never bought it in the first place and I never obtained it. 
then in that case, I wouldn't be wearing it. So it's true, but it's not like it had to be true. You know, under some possible circumstances, that could have been false. Um, and then we could just keep going. I mean, there's so many other cases. I don't know. Um, like, for example, uh, Michael Jordan won six championships. That's true. But suppose that, I don't know, like he had missed that last shot back in 1998 over Byron Russell and uh, the Utah Jazz came back to win in seven. And so in that case, he would have only had five. So it's true, but it didn't need to be true. On the same theme of basketball, I'm a little tragic. Sorry about that. But, you know, Kobe Bryant's no longer alive. Rest in peace. That's true. But it didn't need to be true if suppose he just didn't, you know, take that uh, mode of transportation. Um, you know, he died in a helicopter crash or suppose that the pilot hadn't had the problem that he had with the weather or visibility or whatever. So, okay, the outcome of a sporting match, um, you know, that's one example, which we were kind of giving with the whole Jordan thing. It could just be anything, even the fact that I exist or that you exist, both things are true, which is great. But again, if your parents or my parents hadn't met, then there would be a different reality where we didn't exist. So, okay, I'm just giving you all kinds of examples of contingent truths. You flip a coin, it lands heads. It could have landed tails, so the fact that it's true that it landed heads is, again, contingent. Um, contingent always also means that it depends on something to make it true, which is a part of the reason why it didn't need to have happened. Like, um, my existence is contingent on my parents meeting and conceiving me. The coin landing heads is contingent on the exact angle that it's flipped and the exact amount of force that's used as it's tossed in the air and the surface that it lands on and all kinds of other little physical factors that, that that's contingent on. So contingent truths depending on uh, circumstances, and they could have been false. Now, necessary truths, though, these are things that can't be false. So it's not like, um, you know, LeBron James playing for the Lakers, even though maybe in another possible world he had never chosen to take on, you know, that uh, team. Um, it's something that can't possibly be false. So I wonder if you can think, as you're watching this, of any such concept of a necessary truth. But... Um, it's a little trickier to think of at first because it's not just any event in everyday life that could have played out differently. It's something a little deeper. So here you've got to be thinking of stuff like just like math, like two plus two equals four. No matter what happens in the world, regardless of the circumstances, two plus two equals four will be true. It's not like weather, you know, that depends on all kinds of uh, factors and it's always a matter of contingency or chance. Uh, it's something that absolutely is always true. So mathematical statements or geometrical statements that there's like, say, three sides to a triangle and that all the internal angles add to 180 degrees. That's necessarily true about triangles. And it's not something that is like just a maybe, like whether or not um, the mailman's going to come tomorrow is probably going to happen, but it can't be guaranteed uh, because it's contingent on some possible circumstances that could be different. Uh, but the fact that there's four sides on a square or that all the points on a circle are equally distant from the center or just any other true mathematical, logical, geometrical, trigonometric assertion, they would all be necessary truths. Okay, so I hope that's enough to help you understand this piece of terminology, the distinction between contingent and necessary truths. So now back to our principle of sufficient reason that you see typed out there. What it says is that if something's a positive truth, there has to be a cause for it. And that principle has a specific application to the contingent truths. These are things that are true. Um, they're positively true. And since they could have been false, the principle of sufficient reason indicates that there had to be some cause that caused them to be true as opposed to false. So long story short, basically, the principle of sufficient reason is something that just deeply rooted in common sense. Um, everything has to have a cause. If something exists, something had to cause it. Now we know that contingent truths are those type of things which say that something exists or that some event happened. And these are the things that that principle says must have a cause, an explanation, or a reason. So now we move to the more, uh, you know, getting really deep into the argument. We're getting closer to the final stages of it. <clears throat> the next thing is, remember, the big picture is we're trying to show that God exists. We still haven't quite gotten there, but we're making progress towards that ultimate conclusion of the author. So the next thing the author does is he simply points this out, that the universe exists. This is something that's indisputably true. So here's a truth. The universe exists. Take this statement and just consider what it says. The universe, in other, in other words, the cosmos, right, hence the title of the argument, it exists. 
And um, I don't think that it's possible to really deny that. Or at least if you do deny it, it's like, what are you saying? I mean, you're a part of the universe. Look around you. You can just see it. You know, you see the stars at night and planet Earth. By the way, don't get something wrong. Cosmos doesn't just refer to the outside outer space, but Earth is, of course, part of the cosmos, too. So, you know, we're included in this entire system of space and time that's being mentioned by, you know, the argument. So anyway, the universe exists. That's where we are. And this is a fact that's true, but question, what kind of truth is it? Is it contingent or is it necessary? Now, what the author claims, he thinks that anyone would come to the same conclusion if they just reflect on the question for a bit. But the author's view, and he thinks this is just, again, just general common sense, that the universe, the whole universe, is contingent, that it's a contingent truth that the universe exists. And that means what? That... It might not have existed, that it's something that's true, but it could have possibly been false. So that's why it's contingent, because, you know, you can imagine a situation where there never had been a universe, even though there is one. Now, um, to the point that it's conceivable for the universe to have never existed, that seems to be something that's actually a common ground between people that are either, you know, religious in their belief system, or even those that are non-religious in their belief system, because... Take the secular or non-religious view of the origins of the universe. The current contemporary view of science, the scientific consensus, is that it started with the Big Bang. But the Big Bang is believed to have happened at a specific date in the past because it's, you know, something that is, uh, the universe, they say, is a finite age, according to the Big Bang hypothesis. So that means that there had to be an initiation of the Big Bang, and that means that if that Big Bang did not happen, right, then there never would have been a universe to begin with. So in the case of the uh, Big Bang cosmology, the universe depends on or is contingent on the event known as the Big Bang. Now, suppose you're a believer in God and religion. Well, according to that view, it's creation that causes the universe to start. And it's God, therefore, that makes the decision to generate the universe from nothing. But in that view, the theological view, the universe still might not have existed if God, who has his own will, uh, had just not chosen uh, to let there be light and to create the universe and all of the rest. So whether you're going with the scientific view of reality or the religious one, both sides can seem to shake hands on this point, at least, that um, that the universe might not have existed, either if the Big Bang hadn't happened or if God hadn't created the universe. So anyway, point taken, hopefully, that there's a fact that the universe exists, which is undeniably true, but it seems that it's contingent, meaning that it might not have happened. And so now back to the principle of sufficient reason. When something is contingently true, when there's a positive truth that's contingent, which this universe exists, that's a positive fact, and it seems that it might not have under different circumstances, that means there has to be what a cause, a reason, an explanation for it to exist. So now his big takeaway from all that preceding is that the universe exists. It has to have a cause because it's contingent. So now the only remaining steps in the argument could be these. Since we know the universe exists, and since it is contingent, the principle of sufficient reason says it has to have a cause. But now we have to ask the big question, what could possibly be the cause of the universe? The whole universe, not just a part of it, not just a thing within it, but the entire system of space and time. What could possibly be the, the actual cause of that? So now he has a few points. And ultimately what he's going to say is the only possible cause of the universe would have to be God, um, a necessary being that is the creator God. Okay, so one possibility. Could the universe cause itself to exist? Is that a possibility? Could the universe be its own cause? Okay, and he says, all it takes is a moment of thought to rule that possibility out because it's simply logically incoherent and impossible. Um, so suppose this circle represents the universe. So I'm labeling it with the letter U just to represent that it is the whole universe. I mean, it's just a diagram. But suppose that's the universe and everything in it and all things in space and time, they're just a part of this little circle that's representative of the universe. Now the question is, could the universe cause itself? Obviously though, that's not possible. A thing cannot be its own cause. Why not guys? Because think about it, if something caused itself to exist, then it would have to already have existed in order to be that cause of itself. Um, but it's just illogical to say that because that means that the thing which is the effect is also its own cause. How then could it exist prior to itself in order to act as the cause 
as the causal agent. Um, to get an analogy, could a person possibly give birth to themselves? And again, obviously the answer would be no, because in order to give that birth, you would already have to have existed before, prior, to issue the thing that you are. So it's just a total logical absurdity to say that a thing can act as its own cause, at least if it's a contingent being. So a contingent being can depend on something else, but it can't depend on itself for its existence because then it would have to already exist to generate itself. So this little diagram where I'm drawing an arrow that like loops back to the universe, that's not possible because it's not conceivable that anything that is a part of or within the universe can somehow act as the cause of it because then it would have to somehow be prior to the thing which is supposed to explain. Um, so no part of the universe and it's not the whole thing either can cause itself to exist because then it would have to predate itself. It would have to be something that existed initially, then caused itself, but then the cause becomes uh, the same thing as the effect. So this scenario is ruled out for that logical reason. A thing cannot cause itself to exist. And if you get lost wondering why, just return back to the simple thought that a thing could never give birth to itself because the thing then that is issued would be the same thing as what issues, and that's just impossible. So um, we've got to try again then with another option. The next question the author poses is, well, the universe, which is contingent, which has to have a cause according to the principles of vision reason, what could that cause be? It can't be itself. Could it be something separate from the universe, but which is itself contingent? So it can't be itself. Therefore, it has to be something separate and apart from itself. It has to be something outside and separate from the universe so that it can exert a causal influence on that thing which doesn't yet exist, okay, that it's creating or causing. But this outside thing that's different from the universe, which is its cause, right, the universe is now styled as the effect of this cause. This cause, he says, can't be something that is itself contingent, and here's why. So now we've got a new sort of picture in mind. Suppose this is the universe, and it's caused to exist, but it's caused by something which is contingent over here. That's letter C to stand for contingent. Now, ask yourself, why does this uh, diagram also not result in something that's logically coherent? Well, because suppose that the universe, um, you know, it's caused by something different from itself. That's this. But that this thing is contingent on its own. Well, if the universe, which is contingent, is caused by something else independent of it, but which is also contingent, then the fact that this is contingent means that it also has to have what? Well... The principle of sufficient reason says any contingent positive truth has to have a cause. So if the universe is caused by a contingent being, then this contingent being would also have to be caused by another being. And if that being were contingent, this process of causation that you're tracing back and back and back to the origin, it would just go on forever. So I'm putting an infinity symbol here, which is like a figure eight tilted on its side. Um, and that seems to the author impossible. And to many other people who've studied this argument, they come to that same conclusion that the sequence of causal events cannot be actually infinite in its extension. Because that would mean that there's ultimately no origin to the entire infinite sequence. You know, if it goes on to infinity, there's a cause of the universe, which is a cause of the cause of the cause, like those Russian dolls that, you know, you take off the top and then you see another one nested within it that's just a slightly smaller one if that was to go on to infinity right if there was a cause of the cause of the cause to infinity then we would never have any ultimate grounds or first cause that initiates the entire sequence and we would still be left wondering why then um does the entire sequence even exist because it has no fundamental origins so this is what's known in philosophy as an infinite regress and in philosophy, it's generally believed that an infinite regress is just not possible. So let me put the point here. An infinite regress of causes. An infinite regress of causes is impossible. That's not possible. That's, that's a claim that is made by the argument. So... Um, what does that leave us with? Well, so we say this, taking a stop of the whole argument and going back a few steps to make sure it's all clear. We start with this example of the sphere where it's like you see something odd like a sphere in the woods and you'd, uh, you'd, you'd have a moment of thought about how did it get there and what is its cause. Now that is just used as a sort of sample case 
to bring this intuition to the forefront of your mind that when something exists, whether unusual or commonplace, it has to have a cause. That is just the principle of sufficient reason that anything which exists has to have a cause or an explanation. Uh, then there's this distinction between, neg uh, sorry, between contingent and necessary truths. Contingent truths are things which are true, but they might not have happened. And then necessary truths are things which are true under all possible circumstances and they can never be false. Now, uh, the universe exists and that's true. And the author says that that must be contingently true because it's at least reasonable to think that it might not have existed. So since it exists and it's contingent, principle of sufficient reason applies to it, and it says it must have a cause. Now we pursue this question in further detail. What could be the cause of the universe? Well, one thing we know is that it can't be its own cause, because it would already then have had to exist first in order to cause itself, which doesn't make sense. A second possibility was then tested, and then it's the thought that maybe a contingent being that's other than the universe causes it to exist. But that doesn't help either, because a contingent being can't be the first cause, because it has to depend on something itself. So that would just push us back to another cause of that cause, and that could go on forever, in which case we don't have a satisfying ultimate explanation for the whole thing. So um, what then is the right answer? Here we are now we're ready for the author to tell us. So he says this. <clears throat> the universe, again, a little diagram to help show the thought process. Here's the universe. It can't be caused by itself. It can't be caused by... A infinite sequence of contingent beings that just goes on forever. So what is the cause? It's not going to be a contingent being. It has to be a necessary being. So then I'm drawing the letter N, circling that there. There's got to be a necessary being, a being that is true no matter what, and that could not possibly not exist. And this necessary being is simply his uh, way of presenting the concept of God. God is a necessary um, self-caused being or at least exists through his own essence uh, so he doesn't stand in need of any kind of prior cause to generate him in this way he thinks we only is the only way we could possibly make sense of the fact that the universe which requires an explanation for existing that it actually does exist it can't cause itself to exist and it can't be caused by something separate from it but which is itself contingent on other things because then that would simply push us to ask the question of what caused it and we don't end up getting anywhere. So where all the causal story stops, where we reach back to the origin of everything, we have to find something that is not contingent, something that does not depend on anything else for the fact that it exists. The ultimate originator then of all contingently existing things, including the cosmos itself, has to be a necessary being, and this is just none other than God. God is the necessary being that everything depends on, but he does not depend on anything else. So sometimes this argument is called the argument from first cause or the argument from a prime mover. The reason for that is because this necessary being is described as the first initiator of all other things. He's the origin that all things lie at. And um, he himself doesn't have anything prior to him that generates or causes him. So he's the first cause, or some say the prime mover, prime also meaning first. So he's the first thing which initiates all the change and existence. And um, before him, there's nothing. There's nothing prior to this being. This is a necessary being that's fundamental and real. And um, he causes all other things. Everything issues from him, but he is not derived from anything um, that he depends on. So everything is dependent on God, but God is independent and self-existing uh, on uh, according to his own nature. So that's the argument. It's just that the contingent universe has to have a cause which cannot possibly be itself, nor can it be something which is, uh, is itself dependent or contingent. So ultimately, the origin of everything has to be a necessary being that does not depend on anything, which is not contingent on anything, and that would simply be this kind of being God. Let me read some of the quotes from the author, and you can sort of connect uh, what I've presented here to his words, and hopefully that helps you to break it down and, again, understand it in better detail. So he says at the beginning about the spear example, Suppose you were strolling in the woods, and in addition to the stick stones and other litter of the forest floor, you one day came upon some quite unusual object, something not like what you'd ever seen before, and you'd never expect to find it in such a place. Suppose, for example, that it's a large ball about your own height, um, perfectly smooth and translucent. You would deem this puzzling and mysterious, certainly, but
But if one considers the matter, it is no more inherently mysterious that such a thing should exist than that anything else should exist. If you were quite used to finding such objects of various sizes around you most of the time, but had never seen an ordinary rock, then upon finding a large rock in the woods one day, you'd be just as puzzled and mystified. This illustrates the fact that something that is mysterious ceases to seem so simply by its accustomed presence. It is strange indeed, for example, that a world such as ours should exist, yet few people are very often struck by the strangeness but simply take it for granted. Okay, so the ball example's brought out. He says you'd be puzzled by it. You'd wonder how it came to exist. We don't usually ask that about normal things, but we could. And then he continues, suppose then that you found this translucent ball and you're mystified by it. Whatever else you might wonder about it, there's one thing you would never question, namely that it, did, that it appeared there all by itself, that it owes its existence to something. You might not have the slightest idea where and how it came to be there, but you would have never doubt that there was an explanation. The idea that it might have come from nothing at all, that it might exist with no explanation, is an idea that very few people would consider worth entertaining. So this illustrates a belief that seems to be almost a part of reason itself, the belief that there is some explanation for the existence of anything whatsoever, some reason why it should exist rather than not. The non-existence of a thing um, doesn't require a reason, but existence does. So then we get to the principle on the next page, and he says on page 26 of the assigned reading, um, the principle involved here has been called the principle of sufficient reason. It's a very general principle and it's best stated by saying, in the case of any positive truth, there is some sufficient reason for it, something that makes it true. In short, that there is some sort of explanation known or unknown for everything. And then he goes into the discussion of contingent and necessary truths. He says, some truths depend on something else and are accordingly called contingent, while others depend only on themselves, that they are true by their own very nature and are accordingly called necessary. He gives this example of like a hot something that's sitting on the windowsill, a stone, and he says the hotness of the stone depends on the heat from the sun, and it's contingent on that, and so on. Um, so then he talks about the universe. He says, <clears throat> it happens to be true that the universe exists, and although no one ever supposes that it might not be so, uh, there doesn't seem to be the, in the least anything necessary in the fact that it exists. That no universe should ever exist at all is perfectly comprehensible and seems to not express the slightest absurdity. Considering any particular item in the universe, it seems not at all necessary that the totality of these things or the totality of any such things should ever exist. That's one point I want to make clear as well. In making the case that the universe is contingent, he offers this as a further reason. Because if you simply zoom in on any specific item that's a part of the universe, it's contingent, right? So no matter how big or small, everything has a beginning, middle, and an end. A human life, uh, the planet itself, you know, was formed from earlier, more elementary particles that coalesced into planetary forms after the initial causes of the universe happened. Um, even stars, you know, the sun, for example, as long as they last, they eventually deplete their fuel and then they explode. So, um, Everything in the universe seems to have um, finite limits and a beginning and an end. So he says, if each thing in the universe is contingent, why wouldn't it be that the totality of all the things is also contingent? So then he says, from the principle of sufficient reason, it follows then that there must be a reason not only for the existence of everything in the world, but for the world itself. Meaning by the word world, everything that ever exists except God, in case there is a God. So he used the word world in this essay as a synonym for the universe. Don't be confused that he just says, always oh, meaning only the earth. He's talking about the whole cosmos, hence the name of the argument. So he says, um, so we go on a little bit further and we skip a bit ahead. And he says, okay, if as seems clearly implied by the principle of sufficient reason, there must be a reason for the existence of the universe, and that reason must be found either in it or outside of it in something that is literally within or without the universe. Now, if we suppose that the universe, the totality of all things, contains within itself the reason for its existence, then we're supposing that it exists by its very nature, that it is a necessary being. In that case, there would be no need to say that it depends on God or anything else for its existence, because it exists by its very nature, then it depends on nothing but itself, much as the sun depends upon nothing but itself for its heat. But this is implausible, he says, that, it, that it's necessary, the universe because we find nothing about the universe or anything in it to suggest that it exists by its own nature, 
and we do find, on the contrary, ever so many things to suggest that it does not. Because in the first place, anything that exists by its very nature must necessarily be eternal and indestructible. It would be a self-contradiction to say of anything that it exists by its own nature or is a necessarily existing thing, and at the same time to say that it comes into being or passes away, or that it could ever pass away. Nothing about the universe seems at all like this, because focusing on anything in it, we can perfectly easily think of it as being annihilated or as never having existed in the first place. So anyway, he says then, there seems nothing in the world concerning which it is at all plausible to suppose that it exists by its own nature or contains within itself the reason for its existence. In fact, everything in the universe appears to be quite plainly the opposite, namely that not only does it need not exist, but at some time or other, past or future or both, it does not, does not in fact exist. Everything in the universe seems to have a finite duration, whether long or short. Um, most things, such as ourselves, exist only for a short while, coming into being and then ceasing to be. Other things, like the heavenly bodies, planets, and stars, last longer, but they still can perish. So, as we go on, it would seem then that the universe, in case it exists, and this is beyond all doubt, is contingent, and thus depends on something other than itself for its existence, if it depends on anything at all. And it must depend on something, because otherwise there would be no reason why it exists in the first place. Now, that upon which the universe depends must be something that either exists by its own nature or does not. If it does not exist by its own nature, so if it's not uh, necessary, then it in turn depends for its existence on something else, and so on. So what he's saying there is that if the cause of the universe was something contingent, then that would lead our lead us to our infinite regress, where that cause has to have a cause, and that cause has to have a cause, on and on to infinity. And so he says, so we can then say one of two things. One, that the universe depends for its existence on something else, which depends on something else, to infinity. Or, that the universe derives its existence from something that exists by its own nature, and that is accordingly eternal and imperishable, and is the creator of heaven and earth. The first alternative, however, is impossible because, so the alternative which says the universe is caused by something contingent is impossible because that does not give a sufficient reason why anything should exist in the first place. Instead uh, of supplying a reason why anything should exist, it repeatedly refuses to give a reason. It explains what is dependent and perishable in terms of what is itself dependent and perishable, leaving us still without a reason why these perishable things should exist at all, which is what we are seeking. Ultimately, then, it would seem that the universe, or the totality of all contingent things, must depend on something that is necessary and imperishable, and that accordingly exists not by depending on anything else, but by its own nature. So this necessary being, right, that has to be the origin that causes the contingent universe and all the other things to exist, it must not be itself contingent. It must be something which does not depend on any prior causes, like you and I depending on our parents to have caused us and generated us in this universe, the necessary being, the creator of the cosmos, the thing that the cosmos depends on, would have to be something which itself does not depend on anything prior to it, because otherwise, again, it would be a contingent thing, which would just lead us towards an infinite regress of an infinity of contingent causes. So I don't know, sometimes in science fiction films, you'll get these plot lines involving a multiverse. And in some sort of little stories that I've seen in that genre, there'll be a being in one like universe, that creates another miniature universe and relative to that miniature universe, this creator who's in their own universe is like a God or something. Like there's an episode of Rick and Morty. I don't know if you've ever seen the cartoon show, but like in one universe, Rick and Morty are like just the creation of another Rick who's in a higher, you know, a tier of the multiverse. And it just goes on and on and on. And that, that Rick's created by another one and so forth. But like that picture, what he's saying is just foreclosed. It's impossible because it doesn't really get you to the ultimate origins. It just pushes you back to another layer of another contingent being, which itself is not the first being. So there has to be a first being. There has to be something that's not something that we have to ask what caused it, because that could never be the first being if it's something that does depend on others. So the first thing, the first cause, the uh, origin of everything has to be a necessary being, not a contingent being. That has to be something like God. So that's kind of how the argument finishes. Um, he says, um, a being that depends for its existence on nothing but itself and is self-caused can equally be described as a necessary being. 
Um, because in the case of anything that exists by its own nature and depends on nothing else, it's impossible that it didn't exist, which is equivalent to saying it's necessary. Uh, from these considerations, we see what is properly meant by a first cause, a term that has been often applied by God to God by theologians and that many people have deemed an absurdity. Um, it's common criticism of this notion to say that there need not be a first cause. Uh, but then he just talks about how, despite that, you know, um, this is the only logical explanation for the existence of the universe. Now, there's one last little subtle detail about this that I kind of wanted to just briefly mention. But if you've been able to follow the main line of the argument here, that's the essential part of today's lesson that I really wanted to kind of get across to you. So I'm just going to summarize it one last time now that all the different elements are there. And, of course, this will be a little faster than the discussion that led to us getting here, but it's just a summary. So to start off, he says, imagine someone was walking in the woods and they saw this unusual sight of a spear there, which is not something you typically see in the woods. That would lead you to be curious as to what caused it to be there. But then he says, notice that that same question about what, what's its cause could be asked about anything, not just weird things where we're likelier to ask the question because we're curious about them, but even ordinary everyday things, there has to be a cause or an explanation for them too. So this supplies us with the reason to accept the principle of sufficient reason, which says that whenever something's true, there has to be a cause or an explanation for it. Um, now, next, there's this distinction between contingent and necessary truths. Contingent truths are things that, you know, are true, but they might not have been if things had happened differently. I'm wearing this blue, you know, Lacoste polo, but if I had just reached in for something different in my closet, then this wouldn't have been true. So it's true, but only according to certain circumstances. Necessary truths. They're things that are true, but they could never possibly be false. Common examples to sort of give a way of thinking about that is like math, 2 plus 2 is 4, three sides on a triangle. Those are things that can't possibly be false, so they're necessarily true. Now, when there's a contingent truth, positive contingent truth, it has to have a cause. That's what the principle of sufficient reason says. The next step is to just point out that the universe exists, and according to his way of reasoning, that seems to be contingent. In other words, it might not have been true, even though it it does happen to be true, of course, that there's the universe. So since it's a contingent truth, the principle of sufficient reason says there has to be a cause for it, something that, you know, is the reason that it exists. So um, it can't cause itself. Once you start wondering what the reason of the universe could be, it can't cause itself because it's contingent, and all contingent things can't cause themselves. Um, it can't be dependent on something that is itself contingent because that's not got the self-caused problem, but it also generates an infinite regress where there's no ultimate first cause. So the only thing he thinks that is logically possible is for there to be a necessary being that causes this contingent universe to exist. The necessary being is where like the buck stops, as it were. We go back and back and back and we get to something that itself doesn't have any cause, and that's God. Um, so the last thing then that I just wanted to add to that is that there's one section of the paper where he talks about, well, what if the universe has always existed and it doesn't have a beginning? You might have been thinking that, um, well, it, it's only if the universe has a beginning in time that there's any room for there to be a creator God, because if it has like literally no origin and it's just existed for eternity, then there would never be a time before it for the God to have like brought it out in, into existence. But he doesn't want to concede that point. He says that even if the universe has never had a beginning and it's always existed, still he believes that it would have to depend on a necessary being to uh, sustain its existence throughout that entire infinite time span. And he's not committed to the view that the universe has got no beginning. He's completely happy with the possibility, as science, I guess, currently says, that it has got a beginning in time. But what he's telling you is whether it has a beginning or not, it would still have to have depended on God. So he's going to try to block one objection or separate argument where somebody might say that um, in case the universe is eternal and has no beginning, then it doesn't have a creator God and it's not dependent on a necessary being like God. He says, no, either way you go, whether it's got a beginning, then yeah, it has a necessary being that created it, that created it because he existed before it. But even if it's got no beginning, then here's the view he has. In that case, God and the universe would be co-eternal, both existing throughout that entire duration of infinity of time. But throughout that entire eternity, it has been the universe that has depended on God and not the other way around. So, you can think about the relation that God and the universe would have to each other this, in this case as like um, the relationship of something that depends on something else, but it's not prior to it in time. <clears throat> to give his example more structure, he gives, this, um, he gives this scenario. So he says, imagine that you've got fire burning 
and this flame is burning and it's giving off light as, as fire does. Now, question, between the flame and the light, what's the cause and what's the effect? Well, it's pretty clear, I hope. The flame is the cause of the light, not the other way around. So if this is a flame and it's giving off this rays of light, you know, and pointing off in all directions, the flame is the cause, the light is the effect. Because the light depends on the flame, but the flame doesn't depend on the light. It's not like light just causes a flame to exist, but a flame definitely does cause the light to exist. Now, next question. With regard to these two things, flame and light, does one of them start existing before the other one in time, or do they start existing at the same moment of time? And if you're focused on my question, you'll know that it's the second answer. They come to exist at the same time. It's not like you light the flame and then you wait a while, and then after a time delay, here comes the light. You know, so it's flame and light simultaneously at once. But despite that fact, again, it's the light depending on the flame, not the other way around. So now, imagine, just hypothetically, that the flame we're talking about has been burning forever. It's always been burning. It's an eternal flame. So in that case, it would be true that throughout all of eternity, it's been the light that has been the effect, the flame that has been the cause. The light has been dependent on the flame and not the other way around, but yet they're both eternal. So that's a metaphor, but what it could express is that even if God and the universe are both eternal, it can still make sense to say that that eternal universe has been depending on God throughout all of eternity for its existence and not the other way around. So in that case, our analogy would be that like the flame is to the light as God is to the universe. This depends on him, not the other way around, but they could both be eternal, all right? Way back in the day when I was a student in college at UCLA, and this material was being taught to me by one of my great professors there, Calvin Normar, uh, he, he used a slightly different variation on this example to make the same point. So he said, suppose that you had a giant, right, who's standing on the beach. Okay. The giant's standing on the beach. Their foot is in the sand. And because their foot is in the sand, it's leaving a footprint on the sand. So now, footprint, giant in the sand. One is the cause, and one is the effect. And that's probably even easier to see. Who's the cause? Who's the effect? Well, clearly the giant and his foot are the cause of the footprint, not the other way around. He's causing a footprint to exist by standing there. The footprint's not causing the giant to exist. It's dependent on him, and he's not dependent on it. Now, as we continue to make the analogy hold even closer, I want you to suppose that this giant that's standing in our hypothetical beach has been standing there forever. So that would mean that throughout eternity, it has been he the cause footprint the effect. It depends on him, not the other way around, but yet there's no beginning in time to the dependency relationship. It goes back to eternity. So that's his way of sort of saying that it's not impossible for there to be an eternal universe. Maybe we're a part of a universe that has no beginning, but even if so, it would still have to depend on some necessary being because it is itself contingent, even if it's got no origins in time. Now, again, he's not saying that the universe has no beginning, but what he is saying is that if it does not have a beginning, it would still have to have dependency on God. And if it does have a beginning in time, perhaps then it's even easier to see how it could depend on God because God would exist eternally before it and would institute it at some point in time, though it didn't always exist. Okay, guys, so now we've added a second argument for God's existence to our you know, uh, roster of information in this course. And um, just last few thoughts and words. Last lesson was about the ontological argument, which said that the definition of God alone can prove he exists because he's defined as the greatest conceivable being and existing in reality is greater than only existing in the mind. So he must exist in both since that's greater and he's defined as the greatest. It's all about definitions and words really and concepts, that argument. This one is more about cause and effect relations. Things which exist have to have a cause something prior to them, which, you know, uh, brings them about. And um, it just says that the universe, as much as any specific thing in the universe, has to have a cause. So what could that cause be? It can't be its own cause, nor can it be something which just takes us back to a further sequence of causes, because that's not going to get us to the beginning of everything. So wherever the beginning of all the things is, is something necessary, not contingent. That's God. 
And in the end, he says, it doesn't even matter if the universe has always existed, it would still have to depend on necessary being because it's contingent. Um, in my own opinion, I do think the cosmological argument is my sort of preferred choice if I was using some of these classical arguments to try and you know, defend the preposition that God exists, proposition. Uh, I would, you know, I would rely on this argument most likely because I think it has some general common sense behind it. Uh, and, you know, the ontological argument, sometimes when I see it, we'll talk more about objections to both of these later. But sometimes my view on it is simply that it seems like it's a little bit too much based around definitions and um, wordplay, if you will. But this one at least has a little bit more roots in even scientific reasoning, which says that um, where there's a cause, where there's, sorry, where there's an effect, there has to be a cause, where there's something that exists. There has to be some rational explanation or causation behind it. But, you know, there are going to be objections. Some of them you may be already thinking about. But I'll leave your thoughts to yourself for now as you can contemplate this further. The next lesson I'll post in a few days, and it'll be on the topic of another uh, notable argument for God's existence, which is called the argument from design, or some know it as the teleological argument. And we'll see how that one tries to make its case in a slightly different way for the same conclusion that there's a God. So... Thanks, everybody, for all your time and attention, and uh, do keep reading through the notes and stuff. I'll be uh, grading those recently submitted essays, and uh, I'll be sending back scores to everybody by the end of this next this week. Um, that's by the end of Sunday, which is Sunday the uh, 14th. So until then, well, not until then, but just in the meantime, you know, have a good one, and I'll see you guys soon, and thanks again. So bye.